you don't have a Linux 32-bit system of some sort somewhere, uh, you'll want to get that as quickly as you can, as long as well as there's a Linux executable up on his site. Uh, it's called like Linux debug example or something like that. So that's it. Okay, cool. <coughs> so we have a lot of exercises. Um, it's a lot of hands-on stuff today. So the format is we're going to finish up some of the static stuff. There's literally just like one or two slides left of static. And then we're going to go into dynamic analysis, so using a debugger in particular. Um, we're going to talk about IDAs briefly, but then we're going to do a lot of uh, GDB and Linux stuff. Um, there's several exercises, and I'm going to do an intro to IDA, show you guys how to navigate it, how to use it, um, and a quick little understanding of why IDA is like the number one tool of all time for reversing. So we left off on this exercise right here. You guys created a stack frame. That went well. Um, so anyways, we're on slide 73. So one thing to note is when you have a lot of code, some things you can quickly realize are patterns. Um, and there's different ways to recognize this pattern. On the, on the left over here, you might not recognize that this is a for loop from 1 to 10. Uh, and, but on the right hand side, there's different ways to visualize assembly. You don't have to have this big dump of static text like that. Some programs, in particular IDA and Bin Navi and some other ones, will represent these in graph formats. And uh, these basic blocks are uh, a series of instructions that are going to be executed sequentially no matter what. And then in this middle block, you can see you can either take the path to the left or the path to the right because that's a jump instruction and it's conditional. So you may or you may not take that jump. So you can represent um, assembly in these you know, basic block formats in a graph rather than just this big static dump. And that's really easy because you can start to recognize these patterns, particular in IDA, this dark blue heavy line represents a loop. So you can quickly see this is a loop. And this top block, it's comparing something to nine. Well, so it's probably looping over nine or ten objects. So you can quickly see some stuff in patterns this way, um, rather than the same thing being shown on the left-hand side that might be more difficult to see at first. And in fact, you'll see so many patterns after a while you recognize. I can, I can tell you at a high level what's going on in this graph, even though it's zoomed all the way out and you can't see any instructions. Um, this is sort of this common stair-step pattern you'll see. And what's probably going on here is that in the first block, there is some call happening, some call to some function. It's checking the return value, and if it failed, it's going to exit. If it was successful, it's going to continue. This basic block does something, I don't know what. It's probably making a call, I don't know to where. It's checking the return value, and if it fails, it exits. So this is a series of the stair-step pattern. Uh, it's usually a series of se sequential calls, and then the error checking, and it exits and fails, exits and fails. And then you can see down here it's forming a loop over something. So if you were to stare at the assembly in this in just one big block of text and like that black screen like we were seeing, that would be really hard to recognize. You wouldn't recognize it at first. Um, but displaying them in this graph format and then you can really recognize patterns and it really helps you just quickly identify, okay, I need to satisfy all these cases. Maybe I do or, or maybe I do or don't loop, whatever. Um, but anyway, so those patterns are really helpful. Um, okay, yeah, so in fact, here's a picture of that when I've zoomed in. You can see it's making a call to set sock option. Um, EAX is the return value, right? And it compares it to FFFFFFFFF. Um, well, that's negative one, uh, like two's complement, right? So it's performing a, it makes a call, checks the return value on error, it fails. Goes to this next block, does some stuff, I don't care what. Calls bind, checks the return value EAX to negative one, and then on error it fails. So in fact, this is what this stair-step pattern um, usually indicates. And there's a lot of other patterns, but anyways. So Ida does rock. I'm a huge Ida fan. Uh, I could literally come here and talk about Ida this whole week. Um, but there's just not enough time. So you can do tons of stuff with Ida. Uh, I'm going to go over a demo really quick. So let's see. Um, yeah, I'll show you all this in the demo. But one thing you can do. So this is that same graph on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. And I've simplified it a little bit. So all those failure cases to the left, I've grouped together into one single case. Um, and you can compress sort of these basic blocks and fill them with comments, whatever you want it to be. 
So that, set, that first block, I know there's a bunch of stuff going on, but it makes a call to set sock option. And then the second block makes these two calls, and the third block makes these calls. So I can quickly look at this now and see exactly what's going on here. I don't have to see these huge blocks of all this text going on. Okay. That's a little weird, but whatever. Um, so yeah, tons of info on IDA. We could go over this all day. Um, but so I'm going to do a quick little intro to IDA. So if you have, hopefully you have IDA on your system, bring it up. Um, and let me just randomly pick one of the executables. Um, checker, key checker. Okay, so I'm going to open key checker. I think you guys have key checker. <coughs> okay. So when you first go to open a new executable in IDA, you get this screen right here. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. You can really customize it. You can really have to do a bunch of really neat stuff if you know exactly what you want. But generally speaking, you're just going to select OK. It's identified it as a portable executable, a PE. It's a Windows executable. We're going to click OK. So this, you may or may not have gotten a pop-up. Um, so, and I always close this window down here to give you some more room. <coughs> this is the new view that Ida added. It's proximity view, and it shows you like how all the functions are connected. If you want a high-level overview, this is fine. Um, but if you don't, select whichever block you're interested in. In this case, I'm selecting main. And shift plus will actually bring you into the function now. And minus will take you back out. So if you accidentally selected yes or no to that first pop-up about proximity view, it's okay. You can get in and out of it by shift plus and then minus. So main is what we're interested in. And so this is main. However, we don't want this dead listing view. Um, we're using Ida because of its amazing graph feature. So if you just press the space bar, it's going to switch you between this static dead listing and the graph view. So that's just the space bar. That's all that is. If you get stuck, it's just the space key. So. Is there any way you can make the font bigger? Um, hmm. I do not know. Kind of hard to read back here. Oh yeah, this may work. Let's see how that works. A little better or bigger? A little bigger. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna lose the overview. There you go. Okay. Thanks. And then I'm gonna go ahead and close this. And we can still keep the overview of the graph right here. Okay, cool. So a couple things about Ida. Um, Ida is really smart. We can see here's a call to F open and Ida was able to identify F open as you know commonly from this library blah 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 and it goes okay so it takes two parameters it commented um, the fact that this is key file.txt and it commented for the me for the fact that this is R like I'm open, opening this in a read only mode. Um, another function call down here F read it commented in the argument types well this is a void pointer this is a file pointer and this is a size T, so I, I just smart and it'll recognize this, these kinds of things and fill them in for you and help you identify data types and stuff like that. Um, additionally, it shows you like the function prototypes at the top and it will label things for you. So this is var4, var8, var14. Um, these are local variables and you can notice that their actual value is a negative and we know that EBP minus something is a local variable. We know that EBP plus something is an argument. So when we see argc, it actually just has the value of 8. So when it gets referenced later, like var 8, is actually just saying EBP minus 8. But that's how it references your local variables and your arguments, is variable underscore number, which is variable underscore offset, or arg underscore offset. Um, but since it knows these are argc and argv, like in your standard um, main declaration, it went ahead and named those for you. So a couple neat things about Ida, let's say you figure out what this function, what this does right here. If you just shift, if, if you do a colon, so shift semicolon brings up a colon, and you can comment. So my comment. So okay, so you go a little further down, you figure out what this does. Okay, well this is, you know, settings, okay, what the hell just happened there? Okay, so if you do a colon next to some line, 
you can comment. Um, it says, you know, setting some bit to something. So you can comment your code as you're figuring out what it's doing. That's one of the great things about Ida. Now, another cool thing is variable renaming. So let's go down here to this block right here, this f read, right? So we know that um, Ida told us this first argument is a file pointer, EAX. Well, now look, I clicked EAX, and all the other references to EAX got highlighted. So that's helpful. So I click EAX. I know it's a file pointer. Well, where did EAX come from? We go to the next EAX right before that. EAX came from this local variable, var1c. So, OK, we know this is supposed to be a file pointer. Um, you can either right click and rename, or you can press N. And let's call this, you know, file pointer. And now it renamed all the occurrences of this to file pointer, including up the beginning of the function, it's now called file pointer. So, you know, we can continue with this. F read, um, that last argument, or first argument actually, is a void pointer. So this is your buffer that F read is going to read into. Okay, ECX. Where did ECX come from? Okay, this other ECX, which is actually var14. So let's go ahead and rename this to buff. And now that's been filled in as buff. And any other occurrence of that, wherever that may be, over here somewhere, has been renamed to buff as well. So between commenting, renaming variables, you can actually start filling in the code and figuring out what's going on. You don't have to just keep staring at this big dead listing of code. Um, so let's see, there's a bunch of other cool stuff. Um, let's say, I'm going to go down here to the bottom. Okay, you have the correct key, you win. So you want to note to yourself that this is like your success blog. This is where you want to hit. Uh, this little color icon right there, set node color, you can click it and let's say this is good. This is like where the key gets printed. I want to highlight that green. Um, and let's see, close with no cigar and this other failure case. I'm going to control click these two just like I would control click any kind of you know selection box. And let's say I want to rename these to or change the color in these to red. Okay, so that's sort of helpful. Let's say, in fact, I want to actually group these two boxes together. I can again select them. Um, and then another one of these little icons right here. Uh, maybe I have to right click. Okay, yeah, so you can right click and you can group two nodes together. And I, I know that both of these cases mean I have failed. I didn't find the key or whatever my objective was. So I'm just going to label these fail and rename it red again or recolor it. So now I got rid of two of these blocks and you can uncollapse them and see them or you can recollapse them. And I know that this is a fail case right here. I don't care what's in it. I don't need it taking up space on the screen. I know that this is a failure case. Um, and that's sort of similar to what was going on here when we re re renamed all these and made it easier to read and color code them. Um, so there's a lot of neat stuff you can do with Ida. Renaming your functions, or renaming your variables, commenting the code. Um, if there was a function call, I would show you changing the function prototype, but there's no function calls in here. Um, okay, and if you ever want to figure out how to look at uh, the general place you want to go for everything in Ida is view, open subviews. This really has like all your different options. If you want to see what it's importing, like we saw on uh, Tuesday, if you want to look at the strings, you go to the string sections. Um, we looked at the um, segments or sections and other tools, and there's your text, data, uh, R data, and stuff like that. So almost everything you can find in Ida is through view, open subviews. And uh, yeah, so that, that's sort of your go-to place. So that's just sort of a high-level overview. Uh, if you click anything, um, let's say you want to double-click this function, it'll take you to it. Um, to go to get back from where you just were, it's escape. So your escape takes you back, double-click it, you go forward again. Um, so that's just basic navigation, renaming, coloring, grouping, and stuff like that. Um, any questions on Ida? That's just quick little intro, you'll use it here in a second, so make sure you sort of understand how the commands work. Okay, cool. So, there's a lot of exercises today. 
So this is the first one we're going to do today, is try to figure out the correct input um, to get the program to print the key. OK, yeah. So open up the executable number checker. So in IDA, open and go to wherever your number checker is. Don't do the packed one. And if you're in this view again, then shift plus will bring you inside of main. And space puts you in graph mode. So you can see this graph right here is pretty small. There's only like four blocks. Um, so use some of the stuff we just went over. This says, oops, try again. So maybe you want to group this node. In fact, both of these says, oops, try again, and closer, but try again. So maybe you want to group these as your fail case or something like that, whatever makes you happy. Um, OK, so yeah, open this one. I'll give you guys five, 10 minutes or so. Try to figure out what input you, use, you run this program with. Um, if you're not too comfortable on the command line, that may be an issue. Uh, to actually run the program, uh, open up your command prompt, and you're going to want to go to, where the hell is this saved? Uh, so if you run numberchecker.exe, you just run it, it says, oops, try again. So this is how you run it, it's just a regular command line program. Um, but yeah, so take five or ten minutes and try to figure this out. I'll give you a hint in a couple minutes and a hint in a couple more minutes, and then we'll go over the answer. Oh, one thing you may find helpful is if you click a data type, like a number, like 2F, if you right click it, you can change that to its uh, decimal value, like that's 47. Um, that weird value is 1,000. So you can change the format they're displayed in hex or binary or decimal. Yeah. Thank you. 
Okay, cool. So what have, what have you guys figured out so far? What's the what's going on in the first block up here? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So it's checking to see that it's two. And you get that from argc? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Exactly. Okay, so first we're checking to see do we have two arguments? Okay, great. So what's going on in this block right here? If what's less than or equal to zero? Okay. Um, okay, so correct. So you can see argv is being moved into eax and then plus four. So it's not plus one to reference the, the first one and plus two to reference the second one. It's plus four because each of these is an integer, right? Or four bytes at least. Um, so in your regular main right here, your argv, that's a pointer to a pointer. So we have argv plus four is the first argument we passed it. It calls alpha to i on it, which takes a string and converts it to an integer. And the return value is always an eax, right? So ex is going into here. So I just went ahead and press n and renamed this to arg1 int. So your arg1 has to be an int. Um, it compares that to zero. And if it is less than or equal to, then it, it follows the green line, which in this case jumps to fail. So we can't be less than or equal to, be, to zero. So we have to be greater than zero. And we come here. We check and see, again, arg1 int. And it's helpful because we renamed it so we see what it is. It's not var 12 or whatever. And now it compares it to 1,000. And if it's less than, it takes the green line. So in order to hit this block, we have to pass two arguments. Um, we know that one of them has to be greater than 0 and has to be less than 1,000. Where's the 1,000? You got it? OK. Um, anybody figure out what this is? This one's a little bit tricky um, because it used a, a weird instruction there. But anybody figure out what this block does? Uh, the one that ends in 0, 6, 2. OK, so this one uses a weird instruction. Um, CDQ is convert and double to quad. So your value is not stored in just four bytes, um, like a double, like a D word. It's stored in a quad word now, so it's stored in eight bytes. So it expands EAX to take up um, two full or eight full bytes, and it's combined like EAX, EDX. So it takes up eight full bytes. Um, anyways, and then it divides it by ECX, which is 47. So if you were looking at it like that, remember you can rename this instead of 2F. We want to see it as 47 by right-clicking and choosing 47, because we know what 47 is, and 2f may not mean much to you. Um, and then we divide whatever was in that new quad word by east, by 47. So this is sort of a roundabout way, and then it checks the remainder. So eax and edx are your quad word, and it divides it by 47. So the way I div works is the rem the I don't know, whatever the we call the, the main value is stored in EAX, and the remainder is stored in EDX. So, and then it check what test does is it actually ands the values together. So test EDX, EDX is a quick way of testing to see if it's zero. So this is a really roundabout way of doing it, um, but this is performing modulus of 47, and then it checks the remainder to see if it's zero. So this is compiler optimization. Yeah, go ahead. So if you right click it, you can change the way it's displayed. I mean, you could even show it as, you know, a binary 101. One. Yeah, so when you see some crazy values, it's really helpful to rename them to something that means something to you. Because, I mean, you look over here and you see 3E8, and that doesn't mean much to me. But if you see 1,000, then you're like, okay, so that kind of is a little more intuitive. Um, so this is a little roundabout way of doing a modulus function. It's dividing it and then checking the register that contains the remainder to see if it's zero. But this is just compiler optimization. So this kind of weird ways of doing things like modulus here 
um, you see all the time because the compiler, it optimizes the hell out of everything. So what this really does is check and see if your arg1 int is dividable by 47. And here I collapsed this group and just renamed it that. Um, you can do the same thing up here. So, you know, you, is your arg1 int um, modulus 47, does it equal to zero? So that's what's really going on there. And this does the exact same thing. It turns it into a quad word, divides it by 15, and checks the remainder in the, uh, in the EDX register by anding it against itself. Um, so that was a little bit tricky. Sorry. But uh, you'll commonly have to look up, what, well, what does CDQ mean, convert double quad? You'll have to look up weird instructions like that. So we pass an int that is between 0 and 1,000. Um, and it has to be mod, it has to mod 47 and be uh, whatever, divisible by 15. If we satisfy those cases, um, any, other, any other condition that is any condition that is not met, we notice that we jump to this fail case, jump to the fail case. If we do satisfy all these though, um, we hit this basic block that does a bunch of moves. Um, we're not quite sure what's going on there. And then it prints, great job, the key is blah. So, yeah, go ahead. So, yep, it, exactly. If you just click it and then right-click group node, you can com you can compress any block you want. So the same way that we know this ends up printing the key, we could just select this one block. I could group it and say, you know, prints the key or whatever. And I know that's what I'm trying to hit. So, I mean, if you end up doing that with a couple of these, you can really get a pretty small program. And you can see kind of what's going on here. So it takes a little bit to look up some weird instructions like what the hell that CDQ was. Um, but you can end up getting so, sort of an overview here. Does anybody a quick little scripter and can tell me what's between these values in modulus 47 is 0 and 15 is 0? What? 7 and 5? Perfect. Exactly. Good. So anyone who doesn't feel super comfortable, um, it's right there. I don't know if you can read that or not. Um, and a couple lines of Python. And then exactly the answer is 7 and 5. So if you do pass that to the program, um, you say 705, you know, great job, you get the key. So, any, you guys feel sort of comfortable, okay, working with Ida a little bit, renaming some things, and, okay. Yeah, you don't have, I would give people more time to do this, we just don't have it. Okay, so, feel free to ask questions, but now we're going to jump into debugging. So, we're going to look at the dynamic side of things. Everything we've done so far has been static, we've just been looking at it and then you guys ran the program and, and tried to make it work. Um, but we can step through all this um, piece by piece. And so like I said, every debugger has some common features. You can do breakpoints, you can step into functions or jump over functions. You can show loaded modules, you can search memory for stuff. And the debuggers that are commonly used are down here at the bottom. Um, WinDebug and GDB, are, if you really want to go into it, those are the ones to, to, uh, to use. So one quick note about debugging, sometimes what I see a lot of people that are starting off, they'll run the program and they'll step through it and they'll be like, okay, I can step through it. Um, but what you don't realize is you control everything. Um, if you want to skip over instruction and don't want to execute that particular one, do it. If you want to skip a whole function, do it. If you want to change the return value of is authenticated to true, well, do it, who cares? If you want to just literally change the value of anything in memory to make it whatever you want it to be to satisfy some check, go right ahead. You control everything you want. In fact, you can, in IDA, like we, you can edit the program, change the instructions, and then save it as a new binary. That's how people crack binaries is you just change the freaking code and you distribute it out as a cracked version of you know XYZ software. So you have everything. It's like having the source code. It's just not quite, you know, it's not C, it's assembly you have it all, you can control it, you can change it, do whatever you want with it. So I see a lot of people like, you know, just stepping through it and they could easily just jump right to something. And you know, anyways, so 
in Ida, uh, one thing you'll have to do is up here where it says no debugger, click the drop down and use your local Win32 debugger. That's so now, now you've debugging enabled. That's it. Um, almost all of the debuggers on Windows share the same hotkeys. So F2, if you select a line, will set a hotkey and Ida, Immunity, Ollie. Um, it's all the same. And that means when that instruction is hit, you're going to stop on that instruction. Um, so I've set, uh, this is just some arbitrary thing I picked. So I set um, a breakpoint on this call. I don't even know what this is. Interlocked compare exchange. Um, and I set a breakpoint on it and then I ran it. So when this breakpoint gets hit, um, it, you can see certain things in the debugger like the stack. You can see the, the contents of the registers. Again, you can change all this if you want to. You're running it. Um, and so we talked about how arguments get pushed right to left. And you can see Ida commented in destination, exchange, um, compare, comparand, whatever. Um, so you can see the arguments are pushed on the stack. Those are those last three pushes, and they correspond to the same values in the registers. So anyways, we'll, we're going to do this in a second. So what this is doing, say you couldn't figure out what in the world this interlocked compare exchange thing meant, um, or what values actually get passed to it. So we can set a breakpoint on it and hit it. And then at runtime, we can see, um, well, the first argument um, is pointing to the data section, native startup block, whatever that is. The second argument is 47000. And the third argument is 0. So if you look on, you know, if you go to MSDN and look at the function prototype for this, um, you can fill in the, the data types and you can see it actually got past this native startup block, 47,000 and zero. Um, so it's actually really helpful if you're in a function and you just cannot figure what the hell is going on. If you look at function prototypes, set your breakpoints and hit them, and then fill in the, the values backwards, like we, re, we renamed it um, in this previous example where we figured out where it was reading um, what our file pointer was or what our int arg one was. Once you figure out those data types that are used for functions, you can fill them all in backwards, and suddenly your variables are renamed and things make a lot more sense, and you're not just staring at a bunch of var4, var8, var12 kind of a thing. Um, so filling in those function or filling in data types based off of the functions are very, very, very helpful. Okay, so with a little bit of that debugging in mind, um, this is the next exercise. Use the same binary number checker. Um, but check and see, can you bypass the check entirely? So let me expand these just a little bit. So, so think about this for a second. We want to hit this block right here, right? So there's a lot of different ways you could do this. Maybe when it performs this check right here, I just want to change the resulting register to say true. Or maybe I just want to change EIP to point straight to this freaking function block right here and execute that from the get-go. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. So, you know, play around. F2 will set your breakpoint, and then you can click the little run button up here to run it. Um, after you get rootkitted by me, you can then play with the program and do whatever. So, yeah, the color scheme on this is horrible. So, sorry, yours is going to be different. Um, but so now we can see... Let's see, the buttons up here let you like step through. Should be F7 and F8. So yeah, F7 will let you step through instruction by instruction. Let me close this. And you can see the registers over here each time they change. So this is going to XOR EAX EBP. And we'll see EAX and EBP are highlighted because they just got their values changed. Um, so you can step through these with F7, and we jump straight to fail in that case. So F7 let you step through it step by step. Um, anyways, so play around with this for a second, set your breakpoint, try stepping through it, um, and see if you can get it to just execute this without satisfying, without actually passing it any input, or just by changing return values of the functions, or whatever you want to do. <laughs> So yeah, we got like three or four minutes for that.
So if you're not sure how to change the, the jump, right here my breakpoint is set, and this uh, red line is flashing, that's di the direction it's going to take. This is all based off, it's jumping on zero, so this is based off the zero flag. So if I change the zero flag by right clicking and changing it from a zero to a one, that will make it now take the other case right here. So the zero flag is what controls the jump on zero and the jump not zero instructions. So you toggle a zero flag between zero and one, and you'll jump one direction or the other, depending on what it's set to. So that's how you can do that. And there's two different steps. There's step into, which is F7, and step over, which is F8. So if you're on this call, alpha to end instruction, you want to do press 8 to step over it and continue with the next instruction. If you press F7, you'll jump into this and actually step through that instruction, which you don't want to. How did you change the zero flag? So uh, you see your registers on the right-hand side, uh, this is the ZF. You can right-click it, and you can increment it or decrement it. And so I just incremented it to, to one or decrement to zero. Okay, uh, we got a ton of stuff to do, so I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do this. Um, there's several approaches you could take. Uh, one of them is to modify those resulting jumps. So if I set a breakpoint on my first one of interest um, and run the program, then it's going to jump the, the direction I do not want to go. So I can change the zero flag to a one and keep executing. I'm going to press F8. Keep stepping through. Oops. Okay, I killed it somehow. Um, anyways, you can change the zero flags and do it that way. An easier way is you know you want to hit this block right here. Well, remember, EIP is what controls what's being executed next. So if I just come right here and I right click and I do set IP, it's going to set this as the next instruction to be executed right away and just skip everything else. So wh why even bother? So I came right here, I right clicked, and did set IP. And so now it sets EIP, the register, to point right here. Um, and then it's just going to start executing right here. It just skipped everything. So now you could step through it. And if I look at wherever, wherever Ida is putting the output, it says, great job, your key is reversing rocks. So 
just keep that in mind. You control everything in these examples. I mean, when you're debugging, you control everything. So if you just want to jump right to it, go right ahead. And in fact, in CTFs, um, it's, you can usually get a really low point problem. When you see this sort of format right here, they're moving all these single individual bytes into, it looks like they're separate variables. It's actually a, a character array. Um, and you can right click and change their value again. Remember, that's a V, that's an S, you know, that's a whatever, that's not supposed to be that, that's another S, um, it's an O. So you can change all of these and you realize that it actually, I didn't put them sequentially or you could just right click and change them all and you'd see the answer. So I moved them into random places. Um, so just keep in mind when you're debugging, you control everything, do whatever you want, jump straight to something, ignore things, change it, you have full control. Um, okay. So yeah, that's what I said. Um, most of the Windows debuggers, uh, debuggers are very similar. Um, WinDebug, GD, or WinDebug, Ollie, they're all the same. Except WinDebug. Uh, WinDebug is more command line, um, uh, which is very similar to GDB, which is what we're going to be covering in Linux. Okay, so you'll want your Linux 32-bit VM and the Linux debug example. So that's what we're going to use for this. Uh, we're going to go over GDB, how to use it, some general um, ways to use it. Um, especially if you guys compete in those competitions a lot, you never get any Windows binaries. They're always Linux. So you need to know how to use GDB. Okay, so the general format is you launch GDB and you pass it the program. So GDB, my program, is going to launch GDB, set to debug my program. If you want to pass arguments from the command line, you can give it the dash dash args and say GDB dash dash args my program and then argument one, argument two, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's just how you launch it. Um, and once you're in GDB, it's pretty simple. Run runs the program. Or run arg1, arg2 runs the program with arg1 and arg2. Um, now one thing you want to be familiar with is uh, just like on the shell, if you're comfortable in the shell, um, then you know that when you run dollar sign parenthesis um, some command in there, that command gets ran and then the output of that command gets replaced. It's the same as using backticks. So on the shell in, let me see where the Linux VM is. Yeah. So on the shell in Linux, if I echo and do a back tick and then uh, wow, I cannot press the keyboard. Um, that command, anything in these back ticks gets executed in a separate subshell and a separate sub process, and the output of that gets placed on the shell where it is. Um, it's the exact same thing if you do dollar sign quote or dollar sign parenthesis. It's going to execute whatever is in between these parentheses or back ticks, whichever one you like to use, and then the output of that is replaced on the shell. So now it says, so first it executes that python dash c print a times 30, and that output of 30 a's is placed on the shell. Then it executes the next command, echo 30 a's. Um, that's all I'm showing on that, so I'll, when we get back to it, I will. Rem remind me if I don't when we get back to that, if I can get out of this. Um, but that's all the, the dollar sign does. It executes that command in a subshell and then places it there. So what that allows you to do is print large amounts of things to crash a program or to put special hex characters in there. Like if you needed to put in, you know, dead beef and hex, you'd have to escape them a certain way. You couldn't really do it on the shell just by typing them in. Um, so here's just a little screenshot. I'm running GDB uh, Linux debug example. I did give it the dash Q flag. That just says be quiet, don't print the banner. I don't want to see the banner every time. Um, and then I type run. And it said missing something and it exited. So that wasn't really helpful. We ran the program. It wasn't much different than running it on the command line. Um, so we still need some more information. Uh, I would just open it in IDA, but we're trying to learn GDB. So from GDB, we can do some similar stuff like we can in IDA as well. Let's say we want to see a disassembly of some function um, or main. So you can do set disassembly flavor, and you can say Intel, or you can say AT&T, um, and then you can say disass or disassemble, um, and you pass it a function name. In this case, I did main. 
So we can see main just like we're used to. You could say disassemble function x, y, z. And so you can disassemble as well as debug from within GDB. Um, breakpoints, just like we did in IDA a second ago, instead of F2, since we're on the command line, it's just the command break and then the function or break and then a star and a uh, memory address. So just like we did a second ago, that means when we hit this address, we're going to break and then we're going to, you know, want to examine memory or do whatever it is we want to do, step through it. Um, but with the break command, you can set and um, yeah, so you can set your breakpoints. Um, info breakpoints will show them to you and delete breakpoint um, followed by number delete the specific breakpoint or delete breakpoints deletes all of them. So uh, not super complicated, but if you don't have them somewhere to look at, it's a pain in the butt. Um, so SI and NI are for step instruction and next instruction. Um, step instruction, um, counter to every other debugger on the planet, uh, steps into the function. So if you're on a call, it's going to step into that call and you will now be de debugging that call. NI says next instruction. So if you're on a call, it's just going to skip it and go to the next one. It executes, but it just stops you on the next instruction. You don't have to debug it. So if you're on a printf instruction, you just go to the next one right after it. and It'll go ahead and print. You don't have to debug the print. There's no reason to do that. So here's just a little screenshot. Um, if I'm in some binary, whatever I do, I can SI, NI, 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 NI. And you can see the addresses increase. So we're executing, going to the next instruction. Let me execute, go to the next instruction. And we reach the end. And again, it said missing something. So this is a little more helpful now. We can disassemble stuff. Um, that still isn't helpful, yeah. But it's getting a little more helpful. We can disassemble stuff. We can set breakpoints. We can step through the program. But we still need to be able to examine memory, what's in certain registers, um, and modify it if we want to. So the command that's like the holy grail of GDB is this one little thing. Um, it's scary at first, but it's really not that bad. X slash, and then there's basically three things. Um, so how many is N, uh, F is the format, and U is the unit. Um, so it's easier to just look at example. So examine 5I for five instructions starting at EIP. So this is going to show you the next five instructions at EIP, because EIP is your next instruction pointer. Um, examine four hex, H, or x is for hex, and w is for word. Examine four hex words at the stack pointer, ESP. Examine the string at this address. Examine five bytes at ECX. So that syntax seems a little confusing at first. Um, but basically you just say examine how many of what from where. If I want 27 hex bytes at this address, okay, examine 4 or 27 xb hex bytes and then type in the address. If you want to examine 4 strings at ECX, examine or x slash 4 s 4 strings at ECX. So it seems complicated, but it, that's as bad as it gets, really, so that, it's not too bad. Um, and that'll let you choose what you want to show. And then as far as registers go, just IR, info register, shows you all of them. <coughs> and then IR, and followed by any specific name of a register, will show you that specific register. So now you can, we, now we can accomplish all the same stuff we just did in the debugger of IDA a second ago. Well, now we can do this with Linux programs and GDB. Um, so in this case, I've set a breakpoint on main. Hopefully, can you see that? Let me see if I can, I can zoom in and then scroll down a little bit. OK. So in this case, I typed in run, right? And I hit my first breakpoint. So the only instruction you didn't see here was I typed in break main. That's it. So now we type in run. And we run the program. And it stops when we hit our breakpoint. We've hit breakpoint one. OK. So. Oh, crap, but if I do that, can I page down? Where's your page down? Oh, no, it's not going to let me do that. OK. So, so the first thing I did is run the program. So we hit our breakpoint. So we want to figure out where we are. So EIP is the instruction pointer. Let's figure out where it is we're executing. So we use the examine five instructions and EIP. Uh, your register is in GDB, you prefix the dollar sign. That, that's all. So we examined five instructions at EIP. 
and it shows exactly where we are. We're at this address, um, main at an offset of three. So there's an and, DSP, sub, compare. So this lets us see where we are within the function. Um, so let's see if I down. So we're going to continue until we hit um, some interesting instruction. In this case, let's consider the compare instruction interesting because so far all we've seen is the output missing something, right? So something we're not we're not satisfying something. So if we're on this and instruction, we want to get to the compare. We need to step two instructions: one to get to the sub, one to get to the compare. So I type ni here to step those two instructions. So now we want to we're at this and now we do examine five instructions at EIP again. And sure enough, we're on that compare. So we want to see what's being compared because we're probably not satisfying this check. Um, or we are and we, and we don't want to. One of the two options are happening. So it's comparing something at EBP plus 8 to 3. Well, using our examine instruction, we can see what's in EBP plus 8. So we examine a hex word at EBP plus 8. And it shows us that that value is 1. Okay, so we, that needs to be a 3. We're not satisfying this check right now. So let's see if I can go down a little bit. There we go. Um, no, so what do I do? Okay. So, okay, we accept the fact that we're not satisfying this check. Let's continue stepping through it a little bit. So we step, step, step. Um, and if it would have been equal to 3, we would have taken this jump, jump equal. But it wasn't. So we continued executing. Um, there's a move. And now there's a call to puts, which is like print, print f or you know, print whatever your print version is. Um, and we know that the argument to puts is going to be on the stack. Right before that, it moves into the stack pointer, um, this memory address. So let's see what's being printed to that memory address. So we use the x slash s, we typed in that memory address, and it said missing something. So sure enough, this is the code path we're taking. Um, we're executing, we're, we're not satisfying this compare, we're executing a couple more instructions, it's printing that string which we can find, and then it exits. So we know we're not satisfying this compare. Um, so if we think about main and the function prototype for main, EBP plus 8 we know references the first argument, which is argc. Now Ida was nice enough to tell us that was argc. Um, GDB doesn't quite do that for you. But since we know what main looks like, and we know you people say it is the first argument, which is argc, this was actually comparing um, argc to 3. We didn't pass it any arguments um, besides the, the name of the, of the program. So that's why we only had one. So we need to pass it two more arguments, probably, to satisfy this check. So let me zoom back out to normal view. OK. So, are you going to go for me? There we go. Okay, so if we pass it two more arguments, so if we run it by default, no arguments, we see this missing something. So, if we run it again now with our knowledge that we need to probably satisfy this compare, we, run, we pass it two arguments, it doesn't print that. And so, in fact, yes, we did just take a new code path. We did just satisfy that compare, um, and we took a new code path and something else happened. So, here's the next exercise. Let me see how much time I have for this. Okay. I think, yeah, okay, so this is pretty much it. This is the last exercise. Um, there's a couple more slides uh, after this, but not much. Um, so use a combination of IDA. Open this in IDA, look at it, get a feel for it. In GDB, I just figured out, there's only three basic blocks here, right? Um, I probably just satisfied this one for you. So that means there's two more. There's some kind of checks going on in here, probably, um, that you're going to have to satisfy. So open this in IDA and look at it. Try to figure out what those are. And in GDB, play around with GDB, set your breakpoint, step through those instructions, um, and try to debug it and try to get it to satisfy this check. So the first thing you probably want to do is break main. So you, your breakpoint's on main. So as soon as you run it, you're going to hit that first breakpoint. Um, and then from there, you can NI to step through it. Um, and remember, if you do want to pass it arguments, it's just run hard one. Part two. Uh, this is the Linux debug example. Um, so you're going to want to do it on a Linux 32-bit system. 
you can still open it in IDA. You can still look at it in IDA on your Windows box just fine. Um, you just can't run a Linux program on Windows. Hey, Owen, is the Linux debug example on the Windows box somewhere? I see it in the VM, but it didn't want to let me drag it out. Uh, it may not be. It's on the website, so pull the browser. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank 
Okay, how are you? Are you guys making some progress? This one, this one has a little, a little twist to it, so I wasn't sure how it would work. Um, okay, so what's going on this in the second basic block? You can tell me what's going on here. What? Okay, so here's the call to alpha to i. So it's going to take um, arc four. What's it calling arc four? Okay, so arg zero um, means that from uh, the first argument has an offset of zero. It's actually eight. So this is EBP plus eight is the first argument. Arg four is the second argument. So main takes <coughs> the first argument is arg c. Um, the second argument is arg v. So this is arg v, um, and then it adds four to it. So it's going to the next pointer. So it's arg v at one is basically what that is in in C terms. Um, so the first argument, it and you can check this in GDB. You can set your breakpoint on alpha to i right there, 
and you could check out the value of the stack pointer ESP and you could see is my first argument being passed there or my second argument being passed there. So in fact, that's that's pretty, that's not a bad idea. Um, if you let's say you weren't sure which one is being passed to alpha to int or alpha to i. So we can go ahead and set our breakpoint there on this address, break star because we're passing in a memory address and then I'm going to copy paste it. So this is where I'm going to break. So let's say I just want to run it with some A's and some B's. Let's see which one is being passed to alpha to i. So let's run it with just A's and B's and we've hit our breakpoint. Okay, so if we examine the instruction at EIP, this should hopefully be our call to alpha to i. It is. And we know that argument is pushed on the stack right before us. So if we examine the hex word at the stack pointer, this will show us what is put there. Okay, so it's a, it's a pointer to something on the stack. So let's see what that is. If we examine that string, it's our A's. So that's our first argument that's being passed to alpha to i. So that's, that's what we know so far. So the return value is in EAX. It then gets stored in this right here and is compared to 54 and you jump below or equal uh, to this block. So your first argument gets turned into an int and it must be less than or equal to 54. Okay. Did anybody make progress on, on this block? Can you tell me kind of what's going on? Or what you think is going on? That's okay. Okay. Okay, perfect. No, that's that's great. So what's and what's the end value? STRN copy. What's the length value that's being used? Perfect, exactly. Okay. So it com Ida was nice enough to comment for us. This is our dest, our source, and our n. Um, so let's see what the end value is. ESP plus eight, so the, the third argument. It's EDX. Well, EDX came from ESP plus that four C. Well, if we click it, it highlights back up here. Um, and that was new, uh, that has a value of EAX, which is the return of alpha to i. So we control the end value for an STRN copy. So, you know, like, oh my gosh, pwned, like, we own the lengths, whatever. It's, um, that, that's how you're supposed to type when you own shit. Um, so what about the, so the source, exactly like you said? Um, and we do control the source as well. So if, if we want to figure that out, um, ESP plus four, the second argument, EAX. Okay, we click it, EAX came from the dereference value of EAX, um, and this is grabbing arg2. And again, let's say in the debugger, we want to verify this. Um, so I want to look at the next 10 instructions, and uh, where am I in Ida? I'm looking for the string copy. Um, so maybe you want the 20 instructions. I want to break on that string copy. So let's go ahead and set our next breakpoint there. Actually, I think I already have that breakpoint set. Um, and so let's let's continue then. Um, okay, so now we've hit our, our breakpoint. And if we look at the instruction of DIP, we should be on the string copy. And we know that that string copy takes three arguments. You could look it up online. You could see that Ida commented in three parameters, however you want to think about it. So let's examine three hex words at the top of the stack. Okay, so this is going to be our destination, first argument, our source, the second argument, and the length, the third argument. We passed it a bunch of A's. So alpha to I came back and said, I don't know what that is. That's, I'm failing and returning zero. Had we passed it like a 5 and a 4, it would have turned that into a 54 int. Um, but since we didn't know what AAAAA -A 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 is, it just fails. Um, so if that's confusing, you would look that up online and go, oh, okay, well, that's why. Um, so if we examine that string, the source, it's our Bs. So the first argument, exactly like you said, is being used as the length. Um, or, yeah, anyways. Um, and then the second argument is the source. So we control a lot of stuff for the string copy. Um, so that's really dangerous to whatever this is doing. Um, so if we continue, and let's see what's ahead a little bit. Here's a little trick. If you do display, um, I didn't go into this, but 
you can say display 5i EIP. And what this means is every single time you step, um, you're always going to see um, the next five instructions. Wow. Holy shit. So I can next, 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 and I was going to show it every time. But in fact, this next instruction is really interesting. Um, this is comparing this to this hex value for 1424344. Um, as a little side note, the hex value of 41, so if I'm, the hex value of 41 is an A. The hex value of 42 is a, oh, sorry, 44 is a D, yes. Um, 42 is a B. So that's actually checking to see if some value ends up being 41, 42, 43, 44. It's checking to see if something ends up being A, B, C, D. Um, so let's see what it's comparing. So we want to examine the hex word at ESP plus 76. Um, well, that's just a bunch of zeros, so we're not going to satisfy that check. Oh, shit. Okay, we have like no time. Um, here's the net net. Uh, this one, you, you guys just did code auditing, so you may find this interesting. Um, this one is a little bit of a, can I get out of this damn thing? There we go. This thing is a little bit of a buffer overflow. It lets you copy um, 54 bytes, and the buffer you're copying into is only 50 bytes. So on the stack, you co you're copying, it's a four byte overflow. Well, in those four bytes is where um, this, uh, uh, this value is stored. So if you write like 50 A's or 50 something junk bytes, and then you write ABCD, you're overwriting the next variable on the stack with ABCD. And you satisfy this check. Because you never anywhere in this code set this value, so you can never set it to ABCD. But if you overwrite 50, 50 bytes of junk, and then those next four bytes overwrite um, that variable on the stack. So that's a, so we don't have time to finish that one. but. Just play with it. Send it 50 bytes of junk and then ABCD and debug it. Um, and it's pretty cool. Okay, so hold up. Give me like 30 seconds. This is the, the, the end. So static versus dynamic. It's whichever one you like. I do mostly static. Some people just like debug and they set a breakpoint on a receive and just go from there. Um, but it's a combination of the both that, that's always going to help you out the most. Um, and one quick note about bytecode. So there's a lot of applications like Java, .NET, um, Python. Um, you get this bytecode crap. Uh, it's really easy. You go online, you Google like how I disassemble it, and you download some program for free, and you get source code. Um, it's really that easy. There's almost nothing to it. Your variables are going to be renamed A, B, C, D. But besides that, you get almost complete full source code. It's a total joke. Um, anyways, OK, so hopefully you guys feel comfortable. If I gave you a binary, you could open it up, look at it, play around, kind of figure out what's going on, pass it some stuff, debug it, look at strings and sections. Um, and hopefully that'll help you out in some TTFs and stuff like that. There are some great ch um, challenges. There are some links. Um, and if you guys aren't connected with the null pointer thing, you should be because it's pretty sweet. And the CSG link for my group in UT Dallas I put up, we have presentations about everything you could ever imagine. Um, so feel free to check that out as well. Anyways, okay, that's it. Thank you. What's this? Uh, yeah. What's what's this? You mean here is the book if yes that we um is for you for you that is great hit by eight. I mean here are the address of the so of the that's ag ag uh ag v yeah can you add it by eight? Well well is this address is so if you add it so arg v by default you're looking at um, argv0. So when you add 4 to it, you're looking at argv1. When you add 8 to it, you're looking at argv2. Because those are all 4 byte addresses. But we can see from here, it's maybe this has been the end. Stop the recording. Um, that's just 